Okay, we are live <laughs> at last. Oh my goodness. I'm so sorry, everybody. Um, to those of you who've been waiting for the last 15 minutes for us to get started. Uh, my only previous experience of doing this was with Tabby Boyajin, which I know some of you saw, and we did a live Q&A then. And, uh, and I don't know what's happened, but the Google Hangout portal on Chrome is quite different to before. So I'm just going to give a, a couple of minutes, let people come over. I've put a link over on the old, now dead, live Q&A page. I'm hoping um, people can, can pick this up. OK. So uh, whilst we get started, uh, I can introduce everybody that we have here today. So we have Alex Tichy, who's a graduate student here at, at the Department of Astronomy at Columbia University. Hello. Alex led. Alex led the ExoMoon paper, as you know. Um, and uh, Alex, we've had a busy week, right? Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a pretty crazy week. <laughs> no doubt about it. <laughs> we actually we started early, right? Because the embargo lifted for journalists a bit earlier than the public embargo, right? So that's meant we've had a whole whole fun week of it. That's right. <laughs> and we also have uh, Judith Sulagi, who's uh, Sulagi, who's visiting us uh, from Zurich, calling in from Zurich. Uh, Judith is a, really a world expert on satellite formation. So even though Judith was not involved in our paper, um, we actually cited your work. And uh, we, we definitely read very carefully your work, thinking about how to maybe form something like this. And I thought it'd be great to have someone independent come onto the stream and tell us about um, how maybe we might form this exomoon. Hi, so, everyone. <laughs> Hi, everyone. And thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Seriously, it was, uh, you're on a different time zone, so we appreciate you taking the time out of your day to do this. So we have questions. Um, I know people are still migrating from, from one page to the other. So uh, maybe we've shot ourselves in the foot in terms of viewership, but we will, we will go on all the same. Um, and these videos are archived as a, as a catalog of all of your Q&As anyway. So I know many people can't actually come onto the live Q&A, but we'll still want to hear some of these questions answered. So um, I'm just going to start with one of the most commonly asked questions. I'm going to let um, Alex and Judith weigh in on this. Is this a moon, if it is real, or is it a uh, binary planet, perhaps, or a double planet? Like, how do you define what is a binary planet or, or, or what a moon is? Uh, sure. Yeah, go ahead, Judith, if you like. No, no, Alex, please. <laughs> yeah, so that's, this question comes up a lot, whether or not we should be really calling this a, a, a planet and a moon or a binary planet. I think uh, implicit in this question is the fact that this moon is just so much bigger uh, than uh, anything that most people have anticipated. Uh, the key, though, is that even though this moon is uh, about the size of Neptune, as far as we can tell, and the planet's about the size of uh, Jupiter. The mass ratio that we derive for these two objects is about one and a half percent. So that's uh, you know not terribly off the mark from what we see with uh, Earth and our Moon. Um, and so you know I feel comfortable personally calling this a planet and a moon. Uh, if you look at a system like uh, Pluto and Charon, for example, the center of mass between those two objects lies between the two objects. And so some people would call that a binary planet. Some people would call Pluto the planet and Sharon the moon. So from my perspective, this is uh, sort of a matter of semantics. Uh, of course, it is, it, this is an interesting question in terms of how we get these objects. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, and I think David probably agrees, we, we feel comfortable calling it a moon. What do you think, Judith? Yeah, I agree with, with what Alex just said. And, and indeed, we care about where is the gravitational center. And once we're going to know exactly the masses of these two objects, then we can actually really pinpoint that, yes, the gravitational center is inside of the central planet. So it is a moon by definition. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, we actually, I guess what's kind of nice is that the planet moon separation is 40 planetary radii, we think, from our fits. And we can also, even though we don't know the absolute masses of these two objects that well, we do think we know the mass ratio, which is about one and a half percent. So uh, about one percent multiplied by 40, 40 planetary radii, gives you 0.4 planetary radii. So the center of mass, uh, we think, is inside 
the planet. So that's why I think Alex and I were defending it as uh, being a moon rather than a binary planet. But uh, totally take that the sheer size of this thing might might surprise people and make them think it's more of a binary planet. In fact, we have uh, some some people coming onto the live stream now. So thank you. Uh, I can see you guys, David Murphy, Rich, Madend. Uh, welcome for getting over. Uh, if you guys have any questions, throw them up now, and we'll. You guys are first here, so you'll get you'll get the top pick. Uh, I'm going to pick on another question that was on over on the on uh, I think it was on my video or Alex's video. There was a comment by D Physics Star. This is probably a good one for Alex. Um, is there any chance for TESS, the TESS mission, which is actually just starting to get its first data now, uh, to detect such exomoons where TESS will? Co where TESS will constantly be monitoring the celestial poles. So maybe we're on the pole where it's looking up all the time. Could that be a region where TESS might be sensitive to moons? What do you reckon, Alex? Uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, we've tended to think that you know TESS in general is not going to be amazing for the moon search because uh, the vast majority of the sky will only be monitored for about 27 and a half days or so. Uh, we tend to think these days, uh, you know, based on work that we've done and work that other uh, folks have done, that uh, if we're going to find these moons, they're going to be uh, predominantly found around uh, colder planets, planets farther away from their uh, host star. Those uh, come around much more rarely, so you really need a lot of uh, observation time in order to see those planets. Uh, but this is an excellent point. If we're looking at the poles, there is a what's called a continuous viewing zone where we'll be able to monitor it uh, these stars for uh, basically a full year before it switches over and looks at the other hemisphere of the sky. So uh, that could be uh, great. Uh, now that's still just a year and we're interested in these really long period planets so you've, uh, you're still going to have to kind of get lucky and even if we're monitoring for a year uh, then we would probably see just a single transit of these long period planets. Um, that is sort of what we're thinking now is that going forward if we're interested in finding these moons we're going to have to get much uh, better at handling these single transit events. The moon search uh, has relied a, a great deal on looking at these gravitational perturbations that the moon uh, induces on the planet. Uh, you need to see multiple events in order to, to measure those gravitational perturbations. So a single transit's mm -hmm. not going to be able to give you that. Um, so there's all kinds of new challenges going forward in terms of looking at these uh, much colder planets and, and finding moons around there, but it's, uh, it's always good to have uh, new problems to solve. Mm, no one said looking for moons would be easy. Uh, it's, it's kind of a no one ever said it would be that hard either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, a great, that's that's a great song says. <laughs> um, there's a follow-up question to this from zero one three two one three two, and then uh, Launchpad Astronomy has a question for Judith. So I'll just quickly answer the follow-up from zero. Will Tess be able to get additional data on this candidate? It will. Yeah, it will reobserve the Kepler field. However, this is a faint start. It's fifteen point seven in Kepler's band pass, which is pretty close to visible. And uh, TESS is a little bit uh, a little bit redder band pass than Kepler, but fairly similar. So it's it, it's going to be extraordinarily faint for for TESS to get high quality data on. And of course, the TESS aperture is much smaller than Kepler. So I think we might see barely the transit of 1625b, the planet. But I, I think the chances of having sensitivity to, to the moon with TESS is very low, just because this star is really pushing things for what TESS can do. Um, and then a follow-up question, uh, well, not a follow-up question, but a, a different question, but I wanted to come around to it for Judith from Launchpad Astronomy. You mentioned in your video, so this is our video, but I think Judith's the most qualified to answer it. You mentioned in your video that small moons like the Jovian moons might be less common after migration. Can you elaborate on that? You mean uh, after migration of the planet or after the yeah, migration so of the satellites? Uh, uh, of the planet is really what okay. I, we, the context yeah. of that, I think, yeah. Okay, so uh, first of all, um, we have to talk about the influence sphere where, where the satellites can orbit around the planet. That this is called a Hill sphere, and this uh, scales with the distance between the planet and the star. As the planet is getting closer to the star, we call this migration. The influence sphere of it is shrinking. Therefore, uh, satellites which were once bound to the planet can be unbound eventually as the planet is migrating because then they no longer we feel the gravity of the planet, but they rather going to feel the gravity of the star and they will unbound from the planet. So during migration, we can lose a lot of uh, satellites and 
um, that satellites should only survive uh, close to the star if they are very close to the planet. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so I guess the context there was that we were sort of pointing out that that's why we've not been, I guess, not so successful in finding moons around these short period planets in the past. We've obviously, Alex and I have spent a lot of time looking for those damn things and uh, they've, they've not cropped up. And I think that is uh, potentially a good explanation as to, as to why um, they might be lost. And also we talked to, uh, there's a nice paper about scattering that if the migration um, is a product of scattering between planets. That's also not a not healthy for the moons. That's going to strip off the moons during that process as well. Okay, so um, let's keep going through the questions. We have another one here. Why was there? Uh, it's from Con ZFC. I'm just sort of picking these at random, guys. Okay, so why was there no Hubble observation of this year's transit? Will Hubble observe the next transit? Alex, do you, maybe you can answer that. Sure. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. We uh, the, the last transit of Kepler 1625b was in August, I believe. Um, we were still very much in the process of uh, finalizing our work when we realized, you know, maybe this was uh, something that that we ought to observe again. Um, but uh, we were basically there was not a lot of turnaround for that uh, observation and we were going to have to ask for what's called director's discretionary time meaning we wouldn't be able to go through the regular proposal process we'd be asking for you know sort of some special dispensation to observe this thing again uh, we tried that once before but because this observation uh, is uh, this event is so long we got to uh, uh, initially, the first time we asked for time, we asked for 30 orbits, and they came around and they said, well, basically, we don't usually hand out more than five orbits uh, for the director's discretionary time. And so uh, we pretty much knew that even if we turned around that proposal in short order, it was a very long shot. And so uh, we made the decision that, you know, we've got a pretty good clean prediction still for the May 2019 event. And so that's the observation that we're going to try to make. Uh, we're waiting to hear back on whether or not we're able to get that time. Yeah. Um, there's a, a question here. I'm going to direct this one, I think, to Judith. Um, see, what, see what you think about this. So it's from Perkman. Are exomoons going to be more common to be habitable, I think he means than habitable than planets one day. So maybe are there more? Do we expect there to be more habitable moons than planets one day? Yeah. So first of all, I think that moons are much more frequent in the universe than planets are. So in just by statistical point of view, we can say that yeah, we have we going to have probably more moons, which could be potential habitable worlds. Now, one other uh, very interesting things like regarding uh, satellites, what we see in the solar systems, that lot, lots of them are icy satellites. They have an undersurface ocean like Europa, for example. And if this is the case for exoplanets as well, um, so that means that they formed in such part of the disk, which was cold enough to aggregate uh, icy particles and therefore can have uh, water ice in them then these places could be really amazing places to look for um, uh, habitability because if we will have a liquid uh, ocean under a thick ice uh, crust that would be perfect to imagine life over there yeah uh, I, I think that's like the question of habitable moons is definitely one of the most common things i get asked when i talk about exo moons um, it's it's definitely appealing as a reason to look for these things, but I, I'm sure Judith probably feels this way as well, that there are many other interesting reasons to look for satellites as well, um, just to understand how these things are built in the first place. Um, so they, those are sort of two reasons to look for exomoons. And a third to do with habitability, again, I suppose, is the influence that a moon has on a planet. If we find an Earth twin, I think one of the first questions you might ask is, does it have a moon twin? Because that seems to have an a large influence on the Earth in terms of our obliquity and the tides that it rises uh, on the Earth. So these are these are a few key reasons I often talk about. Um, but certainly, thanks to probably to Endor and Pandora and things like that, mm. people are probably most familiar with the the how to exomoon idea. Okay, so we have a, another question which I think is pretty good here from Con ZFC. Um, so let's say we did have this migration to follow up on this migration thread, a planet starts out at maybe Jupiter's orbit and maybe through disk migration, it works its way inwards over time and it 
starts out with a large number of Galilean-like moons, but then it loses them as its Hill sphere shrinks and maybe it encounters other planets. What is the fate of those moons? Do they become independent planets? Well, that really uh, depends on well, the so-called um, in, um, the internal energy of the system, the planet satellite system. So there are multiple scenarios possible. It also depends on uh, what happens with uh, if they encounter another moon, uh, another sorry, another planet. Mm. So it could be ejected from the system. It could eventually spiral into the star. It could get captured by another planet. It could maybe go on a on an orbit around the star and became a planet. So there are multiple ways to you know, look at this problem and there are multiple outcomes so we cannot say as long as yes, we don't know the masses of those objects and what are the velocities and stuff yeah it's a it's a hard one to give a general answer to yeah. but you you'd have to numerically simulate and yeah. i'm sure it would be extremely sensitive to the to the initial conditions but it's certainly certainly possible it could be um a cap it could remain as a planet it could also actually become a free-floating object as well. Could yeah, ejected out from the system, yeah. Uh, there's, there's been a lot of in, intrigue about that in particular from microlensing, which there was a paper a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago now, that argued that there's a, a very large population of free floating planets. And um, it was a little bit controversial. And there's been a lot of discussions back and forth about the reality of that. Um, but it is certainly an intriguing hypothesis that there could be more free floating planets than there are stars. And I guess one mechanism for that is scattering and moons would be i guess a an example of that that could happen okay so i'm going to move on to another question here uh from powell i hope i'm pronouncing that right um question based on current predictions when do you think other exomoons are expected to be discovered and how many other exomoons are you expecting to discover in the upcoming years Alex, do you have a take on that? <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> the crystal ball. Let's see what's happening. Yeah, yeah this is, um, it's a it's a great question, and uh, you know, people have looked at our candidate in particular and said, uh, in part, you know, is it real because it is so large and so unusual? Uh, now you can kind of go the other way and say, well, maybe it's not surprising that the first one that we find is so large. Uh, that it's, uh, you know, this is the lowest hanging fruit in a way. Um, with the data in hand, we can't say anything about how common or how rare an object like this is. Uh, the, the key point is that with these observations, as I mentioned earlier, we think that these moons are going to be around uh, colder planets in general. So that reduces dramatically the number of targets that we have, for example, in the Kepler data. Uh, if we're looking at these really long planets, period planets, there's fewer of them, uh, both because they come around much more rarely and also the geometrical probability that they will actually transit and therefore we can see them, that's also much lower. Um, uh, in general, if we're looking for small objects, we tend to think if you look at the solar system, for example, the moons in our solar system are all sub Earth radius. So those are very difficult objects to detect even when they're planets. Uh, you kind of need a, a, a collection of, of favorable um, uh, circumstances. You want a brighter star, meaning in this case a nearer by star, and you want a smaller star, something like a red dwarf. These uh, small objects are easier to detect around uh, uh, stars like that. So the Kepler data was phenomenal, but we're uh, coming around to understanding even with that amazing data set, uh, there's still a lot of challenges to finding sub-Earth radius uh, moons, for example. Um, so we're, we're focusing, like I say, more on these uh, long period planets. That is going to require, like uh, the present case, dedicated observations with something, a space-based uh, observatory like Hubble, maybe like Spitzer, ultimately something like uh, JWST. Uh, <laughs> an added difficulty, though, is that these durations of these events are very, very long, and so that's a lot of telescope time that you have to devote to this single science objective. And uh, thinking ahead to James uh, Webb in 2021 or so, um, 
that's going to be a tall order to ask them to give us all that time. It would be nice, of course. We think it's a, we think we've got a good case to make, but there's a lot of astronomers trying to do a lot of uh, really uh, important and interesting science with this telescope, and it's what we call highly oversubscribed. Many more people want to use it than they can possibly hand out the time, and so um, so it's going to be it's going to be very challenging going after these things. I've argued that we ought to be laying the groundwork now and start to get comfortable with the idea that we might make an observation and not know for sure that the moon is there for another three or six or however many years uh, after that initial candidate is announced. We're, we're gonna have to sort of play the long game when it comes to finding these moons. Yeah, and I appreciate that, that is um, a frustrating element of this detection, um, but this is, I guess, a nice example of science playing out, that sometimes you don't have all the answers immediately after doing an experiment you just get a fraction of what you need and uh, you have a you have an obligation to report your results and try to interpret them as best you can so certainly Alex and I did our best job to be faithful in, in representing what we have and I want to say we really appreciate all the comments there's been so many nice comments on Alex and I's uh, YouTube videos so to all of you who put this out there and also many of our colleagues have um, sent you know congratulations and uh, liked the tone that we went for in the paper. So we really appreciate all of the support from you guys who, who think this is worthwhile work to do and um, appreciate the uncertainty that comes with doing this kind of research. Um, okay, so with so that... Alex, oh, Alex Judith, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, just that Alex had a very politically correct answer, but he did not <laughs> did not guess the number of how many you're going to discover <laughs> oh, in the next no, decade. I, I got carried away. The answer is not that many, probably. Uh, it's very. It's going to be very challenging, at least in the short term. Uh, new instruments are going to improve our sensitivity, and that's going to be uh, great. We can see uh, smaller. She's looking for numbers here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, hopefully, a few more. We're we've got uh, some things cooking that we're trying to you know we're trying to find more than just Kepler sixteen twenty five b. Hopefully, you know, hopefully we'll find a few more. But I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't expect a sudden windfall. In other words, we're not going to be spotting hundreds of these things probably unless uh, we come up with a really really clever way of identifying these things that so far we we don't have in hand. Yeah, I'd agree with that. So we have um, a, a couple of other questions. Maybe I can, uh, what, a couple of them were just picking up on this idea of the rogue, but they're really comments rather than questions. So launch Palastronomy says, I'd imagine detecting, confirming rogue planets would be very difficult. And um, then Peter adds, yeah, they'd be dark. Um, so yeah, the dark astronomy, we'd be doing dark astronomy there, I guess. So that, that, that's exactly right. These are very difficult to detect. Microlensing, which is looking at the mass signal, really the gravitational lensing, caused by these massive objects passing in front of distant sources is pretty much your only method of looking for those um, free-floating or rogue planets. So um, that's that's pretty much out of the question for doing it with transit, I would say. Uh, James Damboy wants to know, have you searched have you searched both confirmed and candidate planets for moons? Um, so that's part one of the question. And then part two is there's a planet candidate, KY86801, which shows large TTVs. Um, I actually feel like I know that KOI. Kind of rings a bell. Um, I think I think I've seen, I think I've looked to that like that light curve and those transits before. It is really interesting. It has a very like I think it has a giant sawtooth like TTV, and I think it's a, a fairly late type star, which is also interesting because you have the possibility of detecting even smaller moons and planets when you have a smaller star. But I might be mistaken in, in remembering that. Um, I. I don't remember off the top of the bat if that is one of the objects we included. Unfortunately, many of these KYs, as you probably know, have different names. So some people call them Kepler. Like Kepler 1625 is technically KY 50884. Am I right, Alex? I think that's right. 5084, 58, yeah. Yeah, and we had an internal name for it for a while, which was HCA 4884, I think. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. We have and an anonymized a... re reorder of our, of our <laughs> yeah. KYs. And then there's the kick name. <laughs> Um, so right. there's, and then there's like the two mass four, names. Seven, so four seven six zero oh, four seven eight, if I recall correctly. Oh, that's well remembered. So <laughs> these are these are these. It's hard for me to remember just off the top of my head exactly what object that is. But um, we have looked. Just to give you a sense of what we've looked at, we've looked at um, a, a mixed bag of both confirmed and candidate planets in the past. Um, I think in the last sample there was two hundred eighty four planets. Um, on top of that, prior to that, we've probably looked at another. Um, I want to say around 40 or 50, something like that ballpark. 
a number of planets. So over, well over 300 in total that we've looked at. And uh, yeah, that, that was where Kepler 1625 was found. It was pretty much the only one which we had any hope for and that's applied for HST time. So um, that gives you a sense of statistics. If you want to know more about statistics, Alex is, uh, did, did a huge paper about that. So that could be another question maybe. Okay, so I'm just going to keep going through the questions here. Let's see. Um, actually, there is, I want to, uh, if you don't mind me, me taking the opportunity, guys, I'm going to ask Judith a question because um, there's a few questions here about the detection side, but I want to keep Judith in the loop on these questions. And I, I actually have a genuine question I would like to ask her. Put you on the spot here. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We've kind of talked about this a little bit by email, but I'm intrigued to know your thoughts. How do you form a moon like this? How do you form? Kepler 1625bi, what's on the table, what's not? And, and is there, do we need to invoke completely new physics to explain something like this? Yeah, so it is a very interesting case because we don't see anything like this in the solar system. All the solar system satellites are much smaller in mass and they are all rocky birds. So first of all, it was very um, interesting to me to see that if it's really a Neptune-sized um, moon, it means that it has a significant gaseous envelope. So that's already very interesting. Then the second thing is the a central planet is so close to the star, it's like 0.9 AU, right? So um, mm. this is not where we expect to see satellites. The giant planets form their satellites um, beyond the snow line, so beyond the line where the water uh, can freeze out. This is in the solar system is roughly three AU, so uh, three times away uh, from the star than Earth is. So it's really the outer solar system, and this is where you can form satellites. So one would not expect to see a satellite around the giant planet um, close to the star unless something very interesting have happened. So first of all, for sure, this planet, the central planet, which is several Jupiter mass, it formed beyond the snow line somewhere, so a few way away from the star. And then it eventually migrated in, or there was planet planet scattering, and somehow it got close to the star. So how the moon around it uh, could survive, that, that's a good question. So as satellites uh, are forming the same way like planets, they are also forming in a dust, dust and gas disk. But this time, this uh, disk is around the young planet. And this is where we can form the satellites. And then eventually, when this disk uh, have formed the satellites and uh, the remaining gas dissipated from the, um, from the disk, then the two, um, the central planet and the moon together could have um, scattered around. But then it's less likely that the moon survived around the planet. So what could be is that there was an encounter with another planet, which was this Neptune-sized uh, uh, moon and it get captured. We see something like that in the solar system, and that is Triton, the moon of uh, Neptune. It is a captured Kuiper bar object for sure, because it has a retrograde orbit, so it's orbiting in the opposite direction than how the planet is rotating. So we are sure that it has to be captured and it could not form around the planet. So and uh, as a theorist, I would like to know whether your moon is retrograde or prograde. I know that we cannot say it yet, but mm -hmm. once it will be figured out, it will give us a hint how it could form, whether it formed around the planet or whether it's just a captured object. Yeah, that's a great point. If we could, if we could tell the uh, sense of motion, whether it's orbiting, prograde means it orbits in the same direction. You know, like if the planets go around clockwise around the star, the moon goes around clockwise, as say viewed from one particular angle, that would, that would be a prograde case. But if it's counter to that, we call it retrograde. And it's it is very it's kind of impossible, I guess, to imagine how you could get a retrograde moon forming in situ. So it really does it's a red flag that that something happened dynamically in in the past. There, unfortunately, our current data doesn't let us really measure that. We do allow for retrograde solutions, and we basically find as many compatible prograde as retrograde solutions right now. But um, it is in principle in principle it is possible to eke that out with good enough data. So um, we'll. Uh, We'll, we'll see what happens as we get more data, if we can measure that. There's a few, uh, well, thank you, Judith. I really appreciate that sure. answer. Uh, there's a few questions that um, I want to make sure we catch because people seem uh, to be very keen on this question. So we've had one from uh, Zikan Hong asking, what do we have to do in the future before we can call it a confirmed moon? 
James asked pretty much the same question. I think I saw that question earlier on as well. Um, so, Alex, what would it take for, for this to be to be promoted from our, our self-skepticism and doubt to being absolutely sure or as sure as we can be that this is a real moon? Yeah, so I think uh, I keep coming back to this uh, observation, that, uh, observing it again, basically. Uh, when we uh, uh, initially identified this candidate in the Kepler data, uh, we had these three transits and we generate a moon model and the moon model fits the data in hand. And then once you have your model, you can take all the kind of parameters of that model and uh, run the clock forward in time and kind of see what the moon and the planet would be doing so that each subsequent time the planet comes around, uh, you have a sense of where the moon ought to be. You know, this is just orbital mechanics. You know, you know where things are and you can run the uh, clock forward in time. The problem is, is that all of these parameters have uh, uncertainties associated with them. So you kind of uh, draw from these parameters, run the clock forward in time, and when you run the clock forward very far in time, uh, those model uncertainties really propagate significantly so that you don't have a, a, a super clean expectation of, of what you're going to see. So when we observed the last transit in Kepler, I think it was around 2013, and then we had to run the clock forward four years in time. And so when we performed the Hubble observation in October 2017, we didn't have a super clean uh, prediction for what we ought to be seeing. Uh, by contrast, now we've performed this observation much more recently where we've got a new prediction for what we think we ought to see in, uh, in May 2019. And if we're able to perform that observation, hopefully, uh, you know, if, if you want the moon to be there, and obviously we, we, it would be nice if the moon would be there, we, it would demonstrate that we were right. Uh, we're hoping that the moon will sort of match our predictions. We've got clean predictions, and if the moon shows up more or less like we are expecting it to, I would say that that's a, a pretty clean case that we would say, okay, now, yeah, that looks pretty good. We, uh, you make, this is how, how science works, right? You, you have a hypothesis, the hypothesis makes a prediction, and then you test the prediction, and if the prediction holds up, then, uh, then you're looking pretty good. And so uh, we'll have to see about that. Um, short of that, you know, other people are going to uh, poke at our data and see that we've done everything right. Uh, hopefully it all holds up. We've, we've been pretty thorough uh, with this analysis and we've tried to turn over every stone and make sure we're looking at every possible alternative explanation. So far the moon has held up. Um, so, you know, hopefully it continues to hold up. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully it continues to hold up and hopefully uh, future observations can uh, really uh, nail this thing down. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think we feel pretty good about the reality of, of the signal in the sense that we don't know what else we could have possibly have checked for in that data set. We really did beat that over the head, but it's always possible there's things we overlooked. So that's why the paper's out there. Um, yeah, if, if we see the second transit in the next observation, where where we expect it to be the same shape the same duration everything i i'm gonna feel pretty confident at that point that this is this is slam dunk that this is the real thing because then it's not a one-off then it really is repeating um powell uh asks a, asks a question i'll take this one and then uh i think there's another one that's a good one here for um for judah about tidal locking so powell asks can you talk more about the different methods of detecting exomoons for example, slight differences in the planet's orbital period coming from the wobble of the planet moon system. Yeah, so there's a, that's actually pretty much how I cut my teeth as a scientist, thinking about means of detecting exomoons. So I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, that was actually the subject of my PhD thesis as well. So there's more or less, I'd say, um, two flavors of detecting moons with transits, at least, with the transit method alone. I'm not going to talk about other methods just to save time. The main method uh, that we used in this case, I suppose, was the dip of the moon itself. So we saw the moon pass in front of the star and that caused a large decrease in brightness. But on top of that, we also saw that the planet came into transit earlier. So that means that we, uh, we call it a transit timing effect. And by earlier, I really mean earlier than what we would expect it to if it was following a pure uh, clockwork like linear ephemeris, which is what you'd expect if there's nothing else in the system. So something gravitationally is tugging, we think, on this planet to, to, to cause that transit to come in early. And that is actually the oldest method that I'm aware of that was proposed to detect exomoons. It's called Transit Timing Variations, TTV, um, in a classic paper by uh, Sartoretti and Schneider in 1999. 
Um, so my thesis kind of built on that, exploring uh, the possibility of eccentric moons, inclined moons, and then also coming up with this idea of looking at the durations as well as the timing of the transits to try and eke out a bit more information. But more or less all of those methods that are based on timing are measuring the mass, the gravity, the gravitational influence of the moon, whereas the, the dip that we see is, is measuring the radius. It's a completely different type of measurement. So it's really nice that we see both and they actually seem to give us a consistent solution. Okay, I hope that answers your question, Powell. So next up, um, I think this is a good one for Judith, if you're up for it, Judith. Um, this is actually one I'm not sure of the answer to as well, so I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Uh, give you all the hard ones, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so uh, Marco 2 k wants to know, could a large moon keep the planet from locking to the star? Um, so if you know we have planets which are close to the star, this probably isn't that close, but in, a, in certain scenarios, could you imagine a moon preventing tidal locking? So maybe we should explain what is tidal locking, no? Or yeah, everybody yeah, is familiar with well, okay. Maybe a, a, quick, a quick recap. So it just means that the rotation rate and the spin rate of the moon is, um, is synchronized. So the, as in our case of the moon and Earth, the moon is always uh, showing the same face towards us. So as it rotates, it always shows the same face. This is tidal locking. So um, the question is very interesting, and one has to do a proper calculation of that. I think it, it cannot be said like this, because you have to really look at um, the numbers, uh, the mass ratios, and, and uh, semi-major axes and all these kinds of things. But I guess if the moon is very large, then, then maybe it is possible. But if you have a really small moon, then uh, no, it would not influence this. Um, what do you think? I mean... Yeah, I mean, I would, I would kind of guess the same thing, but it, it would require a detailed calculation. There is a, a zone in, in, you know, which is pretty close to the star that we sometimes call the tidal locking zone. Anything interior to that orbit, you'd expect on a reasonable time scale to tidally lock. And I guess I could imagine that zone extending a bit. If if you had a large moon, it could um, in, influence it and push it out a little bit. Certainly, um, in the Earth Moon case, the the Earth will eventually tidally lock to the moon. So if that happened, it's an interesting thing to think about. Like, what would dominate? Would it would it want to tidally lock to the to the orbital period of the moon, or would it want to tidally lock to the orbital period of itself around the star? So um, I've not seen any detailed calculations on that. Maybe maybe this paper might trigger trigger thoughts like that. Alex, do you have any thoughts? Uh, no, I, I'll leave it to y'all. Y'all, <laughs> <laughs> you take that hard one. <laughs> That's a great question. That's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, let's see. So we have, um, uh, well, we had a, the, we had a question earlier that kept coming up on Twitter. I'm just going to float it out there because Alex has strong thoughts about this. And I think it, it was asked us a few times, and maybe Judith has a perspective as well on the, on the naming scheme of, of how you call these moons. So, um, we called it Kepler's 1625B. That's uncontroversial, I think, to call the, the planet that way. But then we called the moon B dash lowercase i, I think was our final convention. Um, Alex, why did we use that system? And and what is the, has there been any pushback to, to proposing <laughs> that as a system? Yeah, uh, I wouldn't say I have strong feelings on it, but I have thought about it a bit. Uh, the, um, the naming convention for solar system moons uh, has uh, historically been Roman numerals. So if you look at, for example, the four Galilean moons, the four big moons of Jupiter, they have names Europa, Io, uh, Callisto, Ganymede, but they are also alternatively known as Jupiter 1, 2, 3, and 4 with, with uh, Roman numerals. So I like that. I think it's nice and clean and it follows uh, hundreds of years of uh, precedent for, for naming these moons. Of course, we're not going to give them all proper names because uh, we've given up with that long time ago on exoplanets and so the moons, uh, uh, you know, we've taken to calling this thing Nept Moon in the office, but that's not what it's going to be called, of course. <laughs> uh, so uh, I like Roman numerals. But, uh, and that's what was in our initial paper from last uh, last August. We used a capital I for Roman numeral one. Uh, upon further reflection, I think we decided that uh, because this remained a candidate and not a confirmed discovery, we uh, used instead this lowercase I to indicate that it is a candidate. Um, I, I'm aware of a, a naming convention for candidate moons, I guess, in the solar system that just get a provisional uh, 
a regular number associated with it until it becomes a, a fully uh, validated moon. So uh, the, the short answer is that uh, really the International Astronomical Union is uh, the, the body that ultimately decides these sorts of conventions. And so nobody's really had to think too much about what to call these exomoons yet. But uh, going forward, you know, if this one is confirmed and if we start seeing exomoons, uh, the NASA Exoplanet Archive has recently added number of moons to their uh, things that they, they can uh, report on, on planets. So far, everything is zero down the line. But eventually, we will be finding these exomoons, whether or not this is the first. Uh, and uh, so ultimately, the IAU will have to weigh in. I'm going to come to Judith before I do. There's a funny couple of people like the Neptune. Zero says, I hope Neptune catches on like Biden did for VP 2012. Uh, William likes the name Neptune. There's also another name that Emily Sanford, who, you know, Cool Worlders uh, will, will know Emily from her videos as well. And she liked, uh, she came up with Neptune and she also had Supiter for the planet. So it's just <laughs> Supiter and Neptune. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one's pretty. <laughs> they're both pretty silly. You're stretching uh, it a little bit, but uh, yeah, yeah. I kind of like it. Yeah, or you can go just with your names like Alvid or something like that. Alex and David, Alvid, something. <laughs> oh no, I don't think. Yeah, well, Judy, what do you think about this naming thing? Do you care, or is it is it <laughs> whatever? <laughs> Let them name it whatever they want. Well, I, I think the Roman numbers are kind of uh, nice, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't have any strong feelings about this, honestly. I think IAU should decide, really, and that's it. We should just stick to the, their convention. Yeah, um, I, I agree with that. I'm, I'm not too first. So we, we have a question here about the orbit of, of the moon. This is a good one for us to talk about. The best is from James. He, uh, he wants to know the best orbit model. Um, so this, James obviously read the paper because this, this is a very acute question. The best orbit model shows that the moon's orbit is inclined relative to the planet's orbit. Yeah, that's right. It's about, it's about 45 degrees. Um, does this suggest that the moon formed around the planet or was captured? So I think that's a good question for Judith. Before I pass it over, I just want to um, temper it a little bit by just saying that our, our uncertainty and inclination is gigantic. So we, have, we really don't have a huge amount of faith that the inclination measurement we have is um, out of everything we report in the paper, that is probably the most uh, likely number to change, I would say, if we got more data. But assuming it's right, what do you think, Judith? What would the inclination imply? Yeah, so the, this large inclination also for me suggested that maybe it is a captured object because we do expect if the satellites are forming in this disk, what I was mentioned before, then the inclination should be close to zero. This uh, disk, which we call the circumplanetary disk, will be roughly in the mid-plane of the planet. So uh, the fact that the moon is this much tilted, that means that either that disk got somehow tilted, but that's hard to imagine unless the, the planet itself would be also inclined around the star. Um, if it's really turned out to be this 45 degrees, I think that that would be more likely that it is indeed a captured object. If it would form an in-situ, we would expect to have an inclination close to zero, and that's true. Great. Is this something that's triggering your scientific uh, juices right now and getting you thinking about uh, writing a, a paper maybe about this? Or, or do you, are you feeling like you're going to, you know, I would very much be interested to see theorists weigh in on, on this, uh, on these parameters and, and the moon system. So how I, do you feel about that? Is that something that you think is you're waiting for more data or you, do you think that you could cast an opinion already? I, I already actually thought about this years ago because um, from a conf completely different problem, that people often see, observation often see that there is a um, shadow casting on the outer circumstellar disk, which could be uh, coming from an inclined planet with the disk, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about this and did some simulations, but I haven't published anything yet about this. Uh, it's quite challenging to make such numerical simulation, but yeah, um, it's, it's definitely difficult to, to make that happen, that the disk will be also inclined. Then it means that the planet also has to be inclined. So the, the orbital axis of the planet should also be 45 degrees inclined. And then you can make such a, such a disk, which looks like in the orbital plane of the, of the system, then it would look like that, that it is 45 degrees inclined. And over there, you can form a moon, yes. 
But the question is, is your planet inclined, the orbital axis, I mean? I think it's not really, right? Or Oh, I don't think we have any information on that, right, David? Yeah. Yeah, so not yet. No. Um, can you hear me okay? I got a little bit of a, 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 a rattle there in my connection. But um, yeah, I, we don't know the spin orbit alignment. It's actually something we could, in principle, measure if we had very high high precision rate of velocities by using an effect with the Rostam or Glockin effect. Maybe we'd get some information on that. So um, there's a hope that we could perhaps figure this out in the future. There's a, And that's a good uh, thing to lead on to here because there's a, there's a question here about the size of the moon. Um, so Zero says it's hard to imagine how a Neptune-sized moon would be captured. Uh, this is a really gigantic planet. And then Peter says, I think it's about three times the size of Jupiter. So I just want to slight correction there. So actually the size is pretty much Jupiter, but the mass is probably several times that of Jupiter, at least our best fitting models. So it's easy to get mass and size mixed up uh, colloquially when we, when we talk conventionally, but it makes a really big difference for these objects because they're degenerate. So as you add more mass on, they don't get any bigger. They just basically stay the same size. So that's why it's so hard for us to tell how heavy this thing is. You can't just take the radius and say, okay, Neptune radius, it means it's Neptune mass, which kind of works for Neptune. By the time you get up to Jupiter's, they really become these degenerate objects. Um, so that's been one of the challenges is trying to figure out the mass of this planet. Um, we can have a, a weak measurement on it from the um, from the photodynamics, as we call it, which is essentially our, our fit to the, to the transits. But we are hoping to get a direct measurement in the future. And in fact, Alex and I are just actually coordinating um, with another team to try and do that, to try and uh, get some uh, rate of velocity measurements and hopefully really measure the mass of the planet directly, which would add a bit more information to the story. So you got an exclusive here, guys, that that's something we're, we're, we should be doing. If we get given the time, we don't know if we're going to be given the time yet. Okay, um, so some more questions. I think we'll go, we're getting, we, I mean, I guess we were going to end at one. If it's okay with you guys, I think we'll go for five more minutes. And yeah, we started about yeah. 10 or 15 minutes late. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys are okay to keep going? I'm, okay. I'm, I'm cool to keep going. I'm yeah, yeah, me too. Okay, so maybe 10 minutes. We'll, we'll, see, we'll see how we go. Uh, yeah. and, then we'll, and then we'll close up shop. We aim to go for an hour. Uh, so uh, I can see some more questions coming down. So that's why I think we should keep going if we can. So Mr. Tribbs asks, is there any possibility of radio emissions similar to IO and Jupiter. Any thoughts on this, guys? Or should, do you want me to, to wave? You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's your turn, David. This is my turn to take the hard one. So yeah, there's definitely a possibility of um, uh, radio emissions happening in moon systems. This is Obviously, it does happen with IO or EO, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, this is because of the magnetosphere of Jupiter exciting um, uh, particles which uh, come into the electric fi uh, the magnetic field and as they get excited they emit um, and they travel accelerate along these field lines and, uh, and have synchrotron emission they emit uh, radio emission so this actually is a way um, which has been proposed as a means of detecting exomoon systems it was a really nice paper by Noyola and I'll actually forget uh, the first name of the author but it was Noyola um, and they argued that perhaps we could start looking for exomoon systems by trying to find this synchrotron emission. Unfortunately, if you look through the calculations of at least that paper, we're really kind of limited with our current radio telescopes. That's kind of the bottleneck. They're not obviously optimized for this kind of work. Um, and it turns out that your most, uh, and obviously these signals are quite weak as well. So the, your maximum sensitivity is really just a few parsecs, I think. I think I'm remembering this correctly. I'm trying to just recall it off the top of my head. But the, the planet moon system would really have to be around one of the nearest stars for us to have the ability to detect moons this way. So sure, I think I can imagine ways in which we could have radio emissions in this system, but this is a star system which is 8,000 light years away. It, I don't see, given that previous study, what I'm remembering from it, it would seem uh, an extraordinary stretch, even given the scaled up size of the system to imagine being able to detect that in the radio. So I think the answer is probably today, probably not, but in principle, I, I think there would be a, a chance of some radio emission. Good question. Very, very technical questions coming in here. Okay. So uh, Steve Rapper Polly wants to know what is the hill radius of the moon and can it have its own moons? This is actually, uh, Alex and I were just chatting about this, weren't we, before the stream started. 
and the right. disaster happened with <laughs> with getting going on the stream. Ooh. But we were, we were having a nice relaxed conversation before then about the possibility of a moon of a moon. And there was an article that you found. Do you want to? Um, uh, yeah. So Phil Plate is a, 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 a has a lot of followers on on Twitter. Of course, Bad Astronomer is his uh, is his handle. Uh, he's been writing for I guess uh, Discover for for many years, uh, and so he it really does a great job at uh, sort of explaining the science behind uh, latest results. He did some back of the envelope uh, calculations. I think just on Twitter, maybe not even in his uh, his article. He uh, suggested the hill sphere, uh, the hill radius of this moon would be something like 500,000 kilometers. Uh, so this hill sphere is the region of space around the object that you're interested in, where the gravity of that object dominates over anything outside, uh, you know, anything beyond that sphere. So uh, that seems uh, fairly large, and it's certainly plausible that you could have uh, small uh, objects, maybe under uh, in orbit around this uh, around this moon. Um, I think the bigger question is how would you get something like that? Uh, it certainly could be stable, uh, but now we're <laughs> we're going to keep taking more steps down the line. Uh, wh wh where does this moon of this moon come from? And of course, something like that would almost certainly not be detectable. What do you think, Judith? Yeah, so um, I do believe the theoretical point of view, you can have a sub-moon of a moon. So there could be a moon around the other moon. Sub-moon, <laughs> I've not heard that before. Sub-moon, okay. Yeah. yeah Phil played so, called it an exo-moon moon. <laughs> Exo-sub-moon. Uh, okay, now we can go on and go on. Guys. So yeah, theoretically speaking, it is possible because it's again just playing around with this heat sphere and the moon also has its own heat sphere, so its own gravitational influence. Although I'm not familiar of having anything like that that we know of in the solar system, even in case of like asteroids or, or anything. I mean, mm. yeah, I mean it's just two tiny bits of things, and they are so fragile dynamically speaking so they could be ripped off very easily from tides and so on that um uh, i think it would be difficult but maybe one day maybe <laughs> yeah i would also i would also worry about the stability you think about something like a cosi mechanism or something like that uh, uh maybe uh, affecting this long-term stability of an object like that that would be my guess but i'm not a dynamicist yeah uh, yeah, I'd kind of agree with that. I mean, obviously, it is possible to have a moon of a moon or a satellite of a moon because we have satellites in orbit of the moon right now, I think. And there's obviously there's been the Apollo mission. So it is certainly possible to orbit the moon. Um, but whether something naturally ends up in that, maybe that would be a techno signature. Then if you start detecting a large bunch of stuff around a moon, it might be suspicious. Um, so a conversation for another day, I think. Uh, um, Okay, so we have, uh, I'm just trying to trace up to the questions here. Okay, we have another one from 0132132. If there aren't any other planets in the system, I'm guessing, could you maybe figure out the mass based on the orbital period and tiny wavelength changes in the star's light? Might not be measurable if it's that far off, but I don't know, maybe it's possible. What, what do you think, Alex? Could we... Um, measure the mass of the planet uh so yeah the best way to me measure the mass of the planet is through uh, radial velocity observations that's what we were sort of alluding to before we want to look at uh, obtain these rvs that would be the most straightforward way uh david and i looked briefly at uh or well, not briefly we spent a fair amount of time thinking about this uh we have wavelength information from hubble um and so what that potentially allows you to do is say something about the atmosphere. Um, now, uh, the at without going into all the gory details, uh, the atmosphere could potentially uh, tell you something about the mass indirectly. Uh, but because this star is uh, so incredibly faint, um, and we don't have a lot of transits of this planet to work with, and we only just have a single transit of this planet with wavelength uh, information, uh, we basically weren't able to say anything uh, much about the uh, atmosphere, and therefore we couldn't uh, measure the mass that way. Maybe if we have more observations, uh, we might be able to tamp down those error bars and, and characterize the atmosphere a little bit better, but uh, right now that's a little out of reach. Yeah, and actually Mad Ends just had a good, I'm not, I didn't actually think of this, but this is a good comment. Uh, Gaia might be able to help in the future. 
So Gaia is an astrometric mission. It's measuring parallaxes uh, in particular at the moment, but eventually it might also be able to give us orbital information about distant planets. And it's actually predicted to find many planets uh, using that method. So it's very similar. Radial velocity is looking at the star moving back and forth along your line of sight. Um, but if the star is wobbling, it's also going you know, side to side as well. And astrometry measures those position changes as a means of detecting a planet. And it's not been historically a very successful technique, but Gaia is, of course, an extraordinary telescope. Um, so I think it is possible. I think I've not, I actually haven't done that calculation before. It is a very distant star system. We actually do use Gaia to measure how far away the star is. It's, that's how we get this 8,000 light year number. We've, we had so many journalists say, Wikipedia says it's 4,000 light years, but you say it's 8,000 light years. What's going on? Like Wikipedia must be right. And we're like, yeah, just check, <laughs> check the Gaia parallax. It's definitely not 4,000. Um, so we do know the, the, the distance very well. Um, so yeah, maybe we could, uh, for some of the high-end masses, it might be possible we'll just do that calculation to measure the mass astrometrically, or at least constrain it astrometrically. Could be fun. But in any case, we are hoping to get RVs pretty soon anyway. In fact, I think we've already got a handful have been taken. Um, so um, let's let's see what happens with that first. OK. Um, we have some people here talking about James Webb. Um, James Webb might be able to help. James Webb is starting to feel like fusion power is always a few years off uh, to do it. Yeah, that, that has been happening for a while. I think we're all kind of frustrated with that. Um, so maybe we could just comment on that quickly. Um, uh, maybe, I know you're not an observer, Judith, but are you excited about James Webb? Do you think it has? Uh, something to add in terms of your research interests, or is this something which you've not paid too much attention to so far? It's definitely a very interesting mission, and I was very sad to hear that it was delayed by two years <laughs> yet mm -hmm. again. And so it, it was actually pretty devastating for a lot of people. Even I was thinking that maybe I, I should uh, propose some observations because I mean, it can do a lot of very cool stuff, which was not possible before. Mm -hmm. So I'm really waiting for that it finally getting launched and, and operating because I think it will be a great instrument, which will be one of the main astronomical instrument of the next decade. So I'm really, really waiting for the launch. Yeah, and Alex, what do you think in terms of James Webb and exomoons? Is there an interesting opportunity there for us? Yeah, so I sort of mentioned this uh, a few minutes ago when we were talking about uh, future prospects for these observations. Uh, JWST will be a phenomenal instrument. I, 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 I don't know the uh, technical specifications, but I expect the photometric precision will be a, a pretty great improvement over Hubble. Hubble's been an amazing instrument, but it's now uh, 25 uh, years old or so, or you know, even older than that. So uh, J, uh, JWST is going to give us great uh, data. The issue really is the fact that right now, if we want to do transit observations uh, looking for these moons, um, it's a lot of time to ask for. So uh, we're going to have to have a really good case uh, if we want to get that time. In the intervening years, we might come up with, uh, as I said, new techniques that we haven't yet thought of to go after these moons and maybe minimize the amount of time that we need. Uh, but right now, that's, that's I would say, probably the, the biggest hurdle to getting uh, a lot of uh, JWS ST observations in search of exomoons. Yeah, yeah, the, and people are commenting here about the oversubscription. Yes, yeah, we're going to have to have a very strong proposal um, for James Webb to award us time, in particular in the first year or two, because, you know, it's going to be, when it's a new telescope, I'm sure that will be when people uh, are most uh, keen to apply for it. So we are, I think, even given our extension, well, not really extension, but pushing back a little bit because we started late. We are at the end of our hour, so I, I don't want to keep uh, Judith and Alex uh, too long. I know Alex has more interviews to do this afternoon. Is that <laughs> right? You're heading down to the radio station? Uh, yeah, I'll be doing a radio interview. I've done a couple uh, so far, and there'll be another one, yeah. Yeah, and um, Judith, you were saying your inbox has been full, so um, I'm sure you're looking forward to catching back up on, on norm normality as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, yeah. uh, thank you to both of you for for joining us, uh, joining me on, on the on the channel today to, to do this live Q and A, um, and thank you especially to everybody who came and asked us these questions and have been supporting um, us and on the by subscribing to our channel and asking all these great thoughtful comments. Um, we 
we're hoping to uh, maybe shoot some uh, more videos in the future about Kepler 1625, but I think probably for a couple of weeks, we might take a break and catch our breath after all the madness of this last week. Um, but if you keep posting comments either on this video um, down below or on the other videos, um, we'll hopefully be able to re reply to you just you know typing the old the old fashioned way. Uh, so uh, do you, if you have any burning questions, that's a good place to throw them down. We'll do our best to get back to you. So thank you so much. Um, any closing comments, guys? Well, just there were so great questions. So I am really thankful for the audience because some of them was really hard even to answer. <laughs> so thank you very much for being with us tonight and uh, well, for me tonight, sorry. <laughs> and, <laughs> and hope to talk to you guys at another time. And thanks for having me. It was yeah. great. Thanks, Judith. Great. Yes, thank you to everyone who's tuned in. Uh, as uh, David and Judith said, really some great questions. And uh, we've just been very uh, thrilled by the response people have had, uh, both the general public and also the astro uh, astronomical community. We've, we've had a lot of support all uh, every step of the way. And we really can't thank you all enough uh, for your interest in our work and, and uh, hearing what, uh, listening to a, a little more of what we've got to say about it. So thanks very much. Okay, well, I guess we'll wrap it up. Thanks again, everybody. And uh, until the next video, I'll sign off and say stay thoughtful and stay curious. Bye. So long. Bye.